message this morning uh, quickly entitled, I know what I'm made of. I know what I'm made of. And I want you to look at someone and tell them that. Tell them, I know what I'm made of. Even if you don't, fake it till you make it. Look at your next neighbor and tell them, I know what I'm made of. Even if you're not sure, prayerfully, prayerfully, Brother Jesse, by the time we leave here today, you will be sure and you will be confident that you can say it again. Say it with me. I know what I'm made of. Now, I want you to think about everything that's been coming against you because we have to face things. I want you to think about that wily old devil, and I want you to just square up to him in your mind and your spirit, and I want you to tell him with some attitude, I know what I'm made of. I know what I'm made of. I know what I'm made of. Matthew chapter number seven, we'll begin our reading in verse number 24. Here shortly, we'll turn to some other scripture like 1 Peter chapter 2, keep that in mind, Ephesians chapter 2. We'll go to some of these passages of scripture today, but right now, Matthew chapter number 7 and verse number 24, I want to begin our reading. This is Jesus speaking, and Jesus says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on a solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. It is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. They are like a person who builds a house on sand. And when the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. I want to turn your attention one more time to these first couple of verses of Scripture. And that is anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. Like a person who builds a house on solid rock. I want you to go ahead and say with me, that's me, that's me. And verse 25 says, though the rain comes in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against that house, it will not collapse because it is built on bedrock. I want you to say with me again, I know what I'm made of. Just shout it as loud as you can in here. I know what I'm made of. Father, I thank you for the reading of your word. Lord, I thank you that we do not live by bread alone, but of course we must live by your word as well. And Father, today I pray that we are able to see something in your word that is something of sustenance for us today, something that we need, something that you intended and designed for each and every one of us to have. It might taste different to all of us in this place today, but Father, I certainly believe that there is something that you came to give everyone under the sound of my voice today. And Father, I ask you to have your way in this place. Say what you came to say. Do what you came to do. Holy Spirit, have your way. Deposit what you came to deposit. We ask that every bit of fallow ground be broken up. And we pray that the seed that you came to deposit be deposited and planted deep in our soul today. Father, we thank you for this. I move out of the way. I ask you to do what you came to do. In the name of Jesus, and let's all say amen together. Amen and amen. Let's clap our hands one more time and give God praise for his word, which is living. Shout it again with me. I know what I'm made of. High five someone and tell them I know what I'm made of. I know what I'm made of. I take our text for Matthew chapter number seven today, Dr. B, because this is a text that here as I studied this week, I saw from an angle that I've never seen it before. And that is in this moment in time that we perceive Jesus, at least I do, maybe we're different. But 
I have always perceived Jesus right here in this part of Scripture to be what I like to call the gentle Jesus. The Jesus that has not started being so uh, offensive yet, if I can use that word. He has not come to say things yet that are going to make people run away from him and get as far away from him as they can. As a matter of fact, it seems that he's teaching some simple, practical life lessons here in this section of Scripture, Matthew chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 7. Uh, we see things like the Beatitudes in this section of Scripture, and there are some very practical life lessons that Jesus begins to give us. But here at the end of chapter number 7, I realized something, that Jesus begins to make a more clear and definitive assertion concerning who he is to anyone that has any relational proximity to him at all than I realized before. I didn't realize that Jesus right here at the end of Matthew chapter number seven, which is kind of early on in his ministry, is, is slicing things up and dividing things a little more clear than we might think, Linwood. And let me explain what I mean. He says here in verse number 24, uh, anyone. Now, I need everyone to say this word, anyone with me. Anyone. Just say anyone. Shout it with me. Anyone. Anyone. Say this with me. That means me. That means me. Now, look at anyone around you. I don't care who it is. Look at the prettiest person, the ugliest person. I don't care the oldest, the youngest, and tell them that means you. Tell them that means you. He said, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise. And then, of course, in verse number 26, he says, anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't follow it is foolish. He cuts right to the chase, and he covers every single one of us here in these two statements. He makes it very clear. I'm talking to all of y'all. Anyone that can hear me right now is being addressed. And I, I need to make this assertion concerning Jesus as a preacher, Brother Travis, this morning. Because sometimes, uh, even as a believer, we walk with the Lord or we serve Jesus, however you want to phrase that, long enough that sometimes we forget the impact that Jesus really came to have with us, whether we want to acknowledge it or not. We might think it's a powerful thing in acknowledging Jesus, and it is. But it is an equally powerful thing to ignore Jesus. There are many people walking this earth right now that have had the opportunity to adhere, to hear him, to adjust to him, to respond to him, and they simply haven't. But just the fact that we live in a culture that has made a decision to be ignorant ignorant of the things concerning that Christ came to give us, it does not negate the power that he still carries in the big picture. In other words, just because he might not matter in the home that you grew up in, just because he might not matter in the work culture that you go to work in every day, it does not mean that Jesus is less important just because you can't see how important he is. Is. We as believers have to remember that Jesus made some daring assertions concerning himself. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the light. He said, I am the door. I'm the only way. In other words, everyone's going to have to grapple with this thing called life and death, Pastor Norris. And if you're going to have any success in grappling with it at all, then you're going to have to come to the conclusion that I'm the way. Even if you don't come to that conclusion, I'm still the only way, the truth, and the life. What does that mean for me as a believer, Pastor Dustin? That means you ain't got to walk around on planet Earth excusing yourself for the authority that you carry when you decide to walk with a name that's been given an authority that no other name under heaven has been given. I'm talking about the name 
of Jesus. You carry a relationship with the most critical figure that God ever made. And he asserts himself in this way. Stop being so apologetic about the Jesus that you serve. Handle it with grace, but not with apology. Jesus is not Mohammed. Jesus is not Buddha. Jesus is not like one of us. Jesus is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can somebody say amen? There is nobody else like him. And he makes this strong assertion concerning himself to all of us. And I wanted to start there to jolt your spirit a little bit. But also, there's a couple of things in this passage of Scripture that he shares with us that are very pertinent to the direction we're going in this message. And there's two common denominators in this story that are quite obvious that I want to point out and I want you to note. And the two common denominators here is that no matter who we are, because he addresses everyone here, that no matter who we are, there inevitably is some sort of construct happening in our world. It doesn't matter if you are the one that does not want to heed to what he is saying. It doesn't matter if you're the one that wants to stick your head in the sand and not deal with him. Because inevitably, whatever it is that you are doing is causing some sort of construct in your life. There are those of us in here that think we are not building anything. That we are living almost intentionless. And I want to remind you that even a lack of intention is constructing something whether you want to see it or not. If you paused in your mess and decided to act a mess, then you are probably constructing a mess. Do I need to say it again? If you decided to pause in your mess and just start acting a mess because you realized you made a mess, and what does it matter anyway? You are probably constructing a mess in real time without realizing that you are doing it because we all inevitably have to deal with Jesus asserting himself into this world. I'm not saying just into your world, but Jesus came, he lived, he died, he rose again, he ascended to heaven. This is a fact that we all have to deal with. We are all constructing something. Say it with me. I am building something right now. You might not feel like you are. Pastor Dustin, I didn't lay any instruction manual out at the beginning of the week or at the beginning of the year in my house to build anything. I don't recollect anything that I started constructing. No, you are constructing with every word that you speak. With every move that you make, with every thought that you think, you are constructing something of your world. That is how we know that the worlds were framed by the words of God. He was showing us that sure enough, as you speak, you are constructing something for yourself. Everyone say, I'm building something. That's the first common denominator. It doesn't matter who we are in here. We can be the believer, we can be the atheist, which there's no such thing as a real atheist in my opinion, but that's another subject for another day. You are constructing something. Another common denominator and the most obvious one in the story is the storm. Everyone say the storm, the storm. So we have a construct and we have a storm. Uh, I was thinking about this message, Brother Jesse, and I'm realizing that, you know what, it's July. And you know what that means? Don't book any airline tickets to South Florida, to South Louisiana, 
uh, 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 down to the Bahamas. Don't book nothing down in Jamaica or Puerto Rico here in August or September or October. Don't do it because as sure as that calendar hits August and September and October, as sure as it does, there's some kind of storm that's going to become rolling across the Atlantic Ocean. There's nothing that we can do about it, Pastor CJ, but we know, we know, and you know what's bad is that, is that everyone kind of knows that this year with the temperatures that we've been having in the ocean, that these storms probably going to be real bad this year. We know. We already know. I ain't trying to buy no Southwest ticket down to Florida. I'm not trying to go to Miami. I'm not trying to go to the Bahamas. And the reason I'm not trying to go to any of those places is because I know that the odds of me running right into a storm are real high uh, in that season and at that time. And you know what? I know that, that, that there are people that live down there. They don't have a choice if they're going to visit there or not. There are some people, they just live in Florida. There are some people they just live in the Bahamas. God bless them, Lord bless them. Lord bless them. There are some people that just live in Puerto Rico. They live there. And you know what? Of all the people that live there, there are some people right now, Sister Susan, they're already buying sandbags. They're already starting to, starting to orchestrate things in their yard and around their house. They're already preparing to get their windows boarded up just in case one of these big storms come through their area this year because inevitably a storm is probably going to come through. And you know what? Uh, I know about life. You know it. I know it. I just want to remind you as your pastor this morning, there's going to be something come your way. I don't know if it's this week. I don't know if it's today. I don't know if it's next year. I don't know when it is, but there is something that is going to come your way. And the objective of that thing coming your way is to simply show you and expose to you how you have been constructing things around you. Do you know Know that that's really the only point of the storm when it comes to the Lord. The Lord uses the storm just for you to be able to assess how you have been managing the life that God has given you. He doesn't send the storm to punish you. He doesn't send the storm because you've been so bad. He doesn't say as a matter of fact, I don't care how good you've been or how bad you've been. There's a storm coming your way anyway, but the Lord wants to, you to be able to see how you've been constructing your life. Are you learning anything so far? Are you learning anything? If you are, then give me a break. Just say amen. Fake me out. So these are the two common denominators. Everyone shot with me. I know what I'm made of. I know what I'm made of. Look at someone and tell them a storm can't take me out. Say it again real loud. A storm can't take me out. Say it like this. A storm can't stop me. Now look at your neighbor. Boy, look at your neighbor. Tell him you can't take me out. Stare at him. Come on, stare at him. Tell him you can't take me out. Tell him you can't stop me. What does that mean, Pastor D? You can't mess up my construct. You cannot affect my construct. We're not knocking down walls in my house because you decided to show up. You as a person, you as a circumstance, you as a moment in time that I'm living in, we have so many believers, in my opinion, Linwood, in the body of Christ that are so, listen to me, use this word carefully, dysfunctional. 
And we're so dysfunctional because we have tried to combine the construct of our life using him as part of the foundation. But I need to use my codependency on everybody else and every circumstance around me in order for me to keep my wits together and be the person that God called me to be. In other words, if you ain't acting right, then there's a chance that I might not act right. And if... And if you not acting right causes me to say, you know what, I don't want to act right, then as a pastor, I have to ask, have we constructed our lives in a way that we've really built them on the rock and the rock alone? Or have we built the construct of our life on shifty sand? Because circumstances are going to change. People are going to shift. Things ain't going to remain the same. Storms are coming and you're going to have to deal with contrary winds. You're going to have to deal with things that you don't like. Is it going to shake you up and is it going to shake you down? Or are you going to be able to stand firm and remain the person that you were before the storm, after the storm has shown up, done its job, and left? Is there anybody in here that says, I can remain? because I built my house on a solid rock. I built it on a solid rock. Simon Peter says in first Peter chapter number two in verse number four that as you come to him the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. That's important. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, and he's quoting Isaiah chapter number 28 here, See, I lay a stone in Zion. Now Zion prophetically is the church in this hour. So the prophet Isaiah and Peter, in his prophetic nature in this writing, Pastor C.J. says, See, I lay a stone in Zion. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, the living stone, the cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. What do we use a cornerstone for? I didn't come to take you through a long lesson about this, but we're all aware that the cornerstone is the foundational building block for everything else. If the cornerstone is out of whack, then everything's going to be out of whack. If the cornerstone's out of line, then everything's going to be out of line. The cornerstone, it doesn't have its perfect angles and its perfect strength, then everything else can be called into question. But so long the cornerstone is okay, then you can figure out everything else that you have to use. Let me say it again. So long as that cornerstone is okay, then you can use all the other kind of other stones in their imperfections because you have a cornerstone to guide the building process off of. Did you hear what I said? So Isaiah said, Jesus is that cornerstone. And anyone that trusts in him, what does that mean? Trust that he really is that. Anyone that trusts that he really truly is that perfect building block. Anyone who trusts that he can surely, perfectly, with no mistake, no schism, nothing off, be built upon anyone, anybody, who trusts that right there, will never, everyone say never, never. 
never be put to shame. Now, to you who believe, the apostle Peter writes, this stone is precious. Oh, what's he saying? If you believe in what I'm telling you right now, then as I'm talking to you, it's probably becoming more and more valuable, even right now in real time. As you're hearing Pastor D preach, you might even be saying like I was saying when I saw this revelation a few weeks ago, Pastor Norris, and I'm about to talk about it, but I started realizing, oh my God, my relationship with Jesus is more valuable to me right now than it's ever been because I'm realizing what he is in my life, which is a cornerstone. He is a perfect building block that anything can be built upon. Oh, I can go and preach about it right now. That means, yes, I can walk through two divorces and heartbreak and misunderstanding but so long as I make a firm uh, uh, resounding decision that Jesus Christ right now at this point in my life you're going to be the cornerstone that I decide to build my family off of oh I know that it might be a little Brady bunch of a family but when Jesus Christ is the cornerstone every other stone ain't got to be perfect every line will be exactly the way it was in intended to be the strength will be exactly what it was intended to be because he is the cornerstone of my life and if I trust in that then I can never be put to shame you can think what you want about it say what you want about it you can have an opinion about it but I know that I don't have to live in shame I won't be put to shame as long as I keep him as the cornerstone of my life now, for the sake of time, because I ain't got time to preach this all day, the Apostle Paul has an agreeable theology and doctrinal perspective concerning this matter. In the book of Ephesians, in chapter number 2, he references Jesus as the same thing. He says that he is the chief cornerstone. He said that the church has been built upon the apostles and the prophets. Y'all know this verse of Scripture. And he says, but Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. In other words, not just a cornerstone, but he is first in rank, as Bishop used to tell us. As far as importance goes, he's chief. He's chief. In other words, every time I decide to use him as my cornerstone, then I might as well have done it for the first time every time. Because there's nothing about using Jesus Christ that is secondary in the sight of God. Everything that Christ was ever intended to do was principal, was chief in rank and in order. In other words, you might think that you're living a secondary life because you messed things up before. Oh, but I'll take this option that God had for me. But God is saying that's what I had intended for you all along. Can you give God praise? You ain't got to feel like a second class citizen you are living your best life look at somebody and tell them I'm living my best life right now even if I'm struggling this is my best life because this is the one that God always planned for me he wrote it down for me and I'm gonna walk it out I'm living it right now I'm living it so as you come to him the living stone Rejected by humans, you also are being built into your spiritual house. You also are being built into a spiritual house. He goes on to talk about those that stumble because they disobey the message. And what we see here in 1 Peter is the same stark contrast that Jesus asserts concerning himself. That it's not one way or the other. Either you see it as something totally built on him or you don't. Either you see him as the original intention or you don't. Either you see him in being the cornerstone, the original intention of God's life. It's Jesus being the chief cornerstone for wherever you find yourself right now, that is what God has planned for you to be built upon. That is what you are, a living stone, he said. Look at someone and tell them, I know what I'm made of. The Apostle Paul teaches us something in Ephesians chapter number 2. 
and I don't have time to turn there, but if you read the entire chapter, what he's going to remind us is exactly what he reminds us when we read his letter to the book of Romans, which is that the same spirit <laughs> that made Jesus what he is is the same spirit that dwells in us. Look at somebody and tell them, I know what I'm made of. I know what I'm made of. The same substance that dwelled in him dwells in us. You know what's exciting to the Jewish listener concerning these words is knowing the longevity of what he's talking about. It must have been exciting to read the Apostle Peter or hear the Apostle Peter say this or to write this. And mind you, Peter was writing to a mostly Jewish audience to God's elect, actually, in 1 Peter chapter number 1. And to those that have been scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Asia. We know this in Bithynia. He said, I'm writing to you all, and concerning them and to the Jewish listener, it would, number one, answer the question, which was there was a question of the legitimacy of the faith. And the reason that they were questioning the legitimacy of what Paul was teaching and Peter was teaching, one of the main practical reasons was simply that they had no temple of worship. So the Apostle Paul, excuse me, the Apostle Peter is trying to explain to this audience that it was never really God's design for the be-all, end-all to be this place of worship. And it doesn't mean that God is not with us, or more importantly, that something is not being constructed just because you don't have a temple to worship in. Are you with me right now? Don't lose me. This is what... This is what Peter is writing to these. But he also begins to remind them, Pastor Norris, that when you reject the notion that I'm asserting to you, that you are also causing something else to happen in your life, which is destruction, which is confusion, which is a sense that you will never get things together. So not only is Jesus a lovely opportunity to take advantage of and say, I'm going to make him the chief cornerstone of my life. But once you understand what the preacher's preaching and you decide that I'm not going to look at things that way, then you are welcoming sure destruction. You are surely going to stumble when you don't look at him as a chief cornerstone. And I was thinking to myself as I was reading this, well then, it makes more sense, and it makes perfect sense, Elder Parler, when you see how the Apostle Peter just shifted. Are y'all with me? Have I lost you? I'm about to close. To this kind of language as he's writing this letter, because up to this point, he hadn't been talking about temples or stones. As a matter of fact, he's simply talking to the people about the message of the gospel that they heard. And when we get to first. Peter chapter number 2 and verse number 1, he writes to the church, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and all envy and all slander of every kind. Get rid of this stuff. This stuff shouldn't be a part of your substance, Brother Jesse. Brother Jesse, get rid of this thing. And like newborn babies crave sp pure spiritual milk. Rid yourself of all this malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and, and envy and slander of every kind because we're living stones. And if you reject the living stone, then you surely invite destruction into your life. And I thought to myself, if you stay with me here, Kathy, I thought, well, it's usually not a problem no. for me to, when I find myself in a mess, Sister Tara, to go, you know what, I can right now make Jesus the chief cornerstone of my life. <laughs> you preach that to me. He's the chief cornerstone. Yes and amen. My future is secure. My future is so bright it needs sunglasses. 
The problem for most believers is not our self. It's when we have to deal with somebody else's substance. It's when we got to deal with somebody else's mess that we forget that just so much as he's the chief cornerstone in my life and he's building something with my life, he's the chief cornerstone in Brother Jesse's life as well. And if I refuse to see Brother Jesse in any other light other than Christ is the chief cornerstone, then I have invited destruction into the structure of what God is trying to build, not just with me, but with us. Can somebody say amen? So I thought to myself, why did the Apostle Peter use this language? And he used this language, I'm sure, in one part because... In closing, Brother Josiah, in Matthew chapter 16, he finds himself standing at the mouth of this cave in Ty, uh, uh, that was named the Gate of Hades. And there was a fear concerning this cave, all these great superstitions. And Jesus invites his disciples to the mouth of this cave. And right here at the mouth of this cave, right here symbolically in the face of some of their greatest fears, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And some said, I say, uh, I, some are saying you're Elijah, some saying you're Moses, some saying you're John the Baptist. And he said, yeah, yeah, I hear you, but who do you say that I am? And Simon, who was still called Simon, said, I say that you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. That's what I say. And Jesus said, Simon, Simon, he said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. He said, but my father in heaven has revealed this to you. And no longer are you going to be called Simon. He goes, but from now, for, now, now on, I'm going to call you Peter or Petra or the rock or the rock. And upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail, shall not overcome again. Against it, Simon Peter realized in that moment I was the necessary building block that he needed because I didn't care about what everybody else was saying. I knew what he was right there in that moment in time, which is the Messiah. He's the living stone. He's the living stone. He's the living stone. He realized he could be built with. As stones, and I'm sure as he's picturing this in his mind, stones have questions that they have to answer. In Joshua chapter number 4, the Lord instructs Joshua to get, have priests take 12 stones and place them in the Jordan River so that in the future, when future generations come and see these stones, that they will ask those around them, what do these stones mean? So the stones were necessary to secure future. And when we see that we are living stones and we act like living stones, how do we act like living stones, Pastor D? We go to him as the living stone. When we reject him as the living stone, then we stumble, we fall. Another question concerning stones is found in Nehemiah chapter number four. And this is, what, this is how I want to end. Because in Nehemiah chapter 4, it made Sam Ballot so mad that Nehemiah had begun to rebuild the wall. It, it made him mad. And, and because there's always, there's always going to be, you know, those weeds in the field. Jesus talked about it. There's always going to be those amongst us that try to discourage us from being what God called us to be. There's always going to be those that tell us that it's a waste to try that hard. There's always going to be those that tell us that we're really accomplishing nothing and serving the Lord the way that we are. We're always going to hear those detracting voices. And that's what San Ballad was. And one of the questions that he said is, did these feeble Jews think that they can get 
these stones revived? Can they get them to live again, seeing how burned, how charred, how unusable they seem? And really, that's the question here this morning, is can you see yourself in such a way that not only you can be built with, but you can be built upon? I want you to ask yourself those two questions. Can I be built with? Can I be built with? And can I be built upon? Can I be built with means do I have the substance? Do I have what it takes for God to use me? And I pray that I clearly answer that question for you today. That yes, you have what it takes. So long as you look at Christ as the chief cornerstone, you can build from right here and right now. If you walked in here and you say, Pastor D, my marriage is hurting right now. If you look at Jesus Christ to be the chief cornerstone, I promise you can build the best marriage and the one that God always intended and purposed for you to have. Concerning your life, concerning your thoughts, concerning your relationship with your children, concerning your soul, concerning the places that you've been hurt. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Until you put him in place and begin to build with him, some of you have no idea what you're even capable of constructing. Constructing. Some of you think that you're only capable of destruction because every time you try to construct, it ends up being destroyed because you ain't used him as the chief cornerstone. You ain't put him in place of that pain yet to say, no, that right there was not that right there God always intended to use in my life I'm going to put Jesus there as the chief cornerstone of my life I'm going to build from that place I'm going to build from that place so not only can I be built with but can I be built upon can I handle being next to someone else in all of their substance in all of their carrying the spirit and the will of God along with their imperfections along with their messed up lives. Because guess what? There's only one chief cornerstone. And it ain't Pastor D. It ain't Pastor Norris. Even though he's one of the, one of the better building blocks that I think we've ever seen. It ain't, ain't any of us. We're not the chief cornerstone. What you're going to find, and you can stand to your feet as God begins to construct and build us, is that when you have what it takes to be built with, then you have the stuff it takes to be built upon. 